So I want to just pick up where we left off, all right? And I, I apologize. One of the reasons why I want to extend the homework is because I'm kind of taking it very, very slowly as we set up our problems. I'm probably a little too slowly. Um, but one of the complaints I get a lot from this class is you come out of it and you don't really understand. You get this thing about, we'll talk about enthalpy and entropy and use for energy and equilibrium and all these concepts. But a lot of people don't really understand the big picture. All right, so what I've done is kind of methodically build up that big picture and we can focus in. So it's taken us a little bit more time, but we'll make it up in dividends when we get later because we'll all be more comfortable with kind of the fundamentals and we can build up chemistry kind of in a bootstrap way from simplicity to more complex. All right, so we're just kind of slowly moving into things. And today, uh, we now have the chance to really start to think about doing actual calculations, measuring something, predicting things, all right? We, we came up with this, let me just recap where we were. Remember our question here, ultimately, was that we have a box that's separated into two boxes. We've partitioned the box with a piston. Um, I made a mistake last class about this piston. So this is a piston that's fixed. All right, so I'll put a little X's here to say that it can't move right now. And this piston um, is what we call diathermal. I said it was closed, which means that no heat, no energy, or no mass can move through the piston. But in fact, we need to think about it, whether energy can exchange but not mass. So diathermal means heat is allowed to transfer. Energy can cross barrier, but not mass. Okay, So you can kind of think of it as an actual metal surface, right? right? If you have a nice piece of aluminum here, the, the, if you have one region that's hotter than the other, and you have a piece of aluminum separating, that heat will transfer, but the mass, right, if it's perfectly sealed, the mass won't move, right? You can move energy, but not mass. Right? And the, of course, the important thing is that this box itself is closed. Right? The box itself is a closed environment, so that means nothing can leave the box, but, things can, but energy can move between the sub-boxes, the two boxes, the, the, the components, or the compartments, however you want to think about it. All right, so we got closed box. All right, and remember that we specified the initial conditions of both sides. We said that U1 with each box had an energy, a volume, and a number of molecules in it, or atoms. V2, V2, and N2. All right, remember what we did on the board was I removed the constraint. I let the piston move, right? And the piston, depending on the conditions, is either going to move to the left or move to the right or not move at all, right? And we wanted to figure out where, what condition is satisfied when the piston stops, right? We don't know which way it's going to go, but using the things that we can measure about our system, can we figure out what's the condition that must be satisfied in the box energetically such that the piston is no longer moving? Right? What, sat what has to be satisfied, right? And so we, we spent a long time kind of building up the mathematics of this. And of course, we came up with this really lovely equation, Gibbs's equation, the one that was created here in New Haven, which is that the change in the energy as that piston moves a little bit or any changes happen is the temperature times the change in entropy minus the pressure of the box times the change in volume Plus, for all the components of the gas, let's say there are n components of the gas. So you've got a little bit of oxygen, a little bit of argon, a little bit of nitrogen. You have some components of the so-called chemical potential times the change in the mole number. Okay, and right, and we kind of identified this. Right, this is what what we're going to see is this is what we call heat. The change in heat. This right here is what we call work. Mechanical work, right? The change in how we exert energy in filling the box. And this is what's called chemical work. All right? And we're not going to worry about chemical work here in this problem because in order for this to be non zero, the, the, the component numbers need to change. 
And this box is closed, right? There's no change in chemicals, right? Nothing's leaving the box. So this number basically goes to zero. But if we have an equilibrium between two uh, reactants and a product, we may want to consider that in the future. And we will. So um, where was I? So right. So the so what we did now is again what we have to set a some conditions. Let's make some assumptions. First of all, is that energy is conserved. So the energy of the first box plus the energy of the second box is a constant. Right? It's some number. And that means again that the total, that the net change in those numbers. So D, the change in D1 plus the change in the second box energy is zero. Okay? So if the energy of box one goes up, the energy in box two has to come down. And that's also true for volume and N, right? It's true for all of them. All of these are conserved. Everything is conserved. Everything is conserved here. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to, we're going to exchange energy back and forth, or volume back and forth, N is not moving, until we reach some equilibrium where everything is kosher and happy. And the way that we did that, remember, so that the objective to finding where that happens is where the entropy reaches its maximum value, right? So we want to find, find state where the total entropy of the system, S total, which is the sum, because the entropy is linear, of the two entropies of the two box reaches a maximum. Right. And this was at the end of class, and we kind of did a little bit of algebra. We worked through it. Um, I posted the lecture notes um, on how, to, how this math works. Um, so you can go back if you don't remember if it's not in your notes. Um, and what we found is that the condition where the entropy gets maximized for this system is very, very simple. Right? So the condition where the piston stops so the final state where, where S total is max is where the temperature of box one is exactly equal to the temperature of box two. Okay, so the system, oh no, that's not good. The system is going to move the piston around until the, entry, until the temperature between, uh, in each of the boxes are equal, okay? So if, for instance, the temperature of both boxes are equal at the beginning, the piston's not gonna move, right? Because the entropy is already maximum. Sorry, I had the, my stylus thing exploded. And we also saw that this final state, not only is that the entropy is maximum, but also that the total energy, U, is minimum. So the system will adjust itself, as I said, to be optimally dis disorganized, messy, if you will, and lazy as possible, lowest possible energy and maximum possible entropy. Okay. This is the result of any what we call a thermodynamic state. Any thermodynamic state, which is again a state where the box or your chemical system can be adequately described by these three parameters, U, V, and N, or V, N, and S, whatever, whatever parameters you choose, and they have no time dependence, right? It only depends on the variables. And that always is. That's satisfied when you're in a position where the total entropy is maximum and the minimum energy, or sorry, the energy is minimum. Total energy is minimum. All right, so what that means is that the, if you think about the energy as being kind of different components, right? It's got some energy that's partitioned into the entropic parts, some entropy in the, or sorry, some energy is in the mechanical part to fill the box. There may be some chemical energy that needs to be expended to reach equilibrium. But the idea is, is that the maximum amount of energy is pumped into the heat part, the entropy part, and that satisfies also this, that the energy is, low, is possibly low. Okay? 
Okay, so it wants to basically partition its energy in as widely as possible through as many possible motions and modes of the system, and that actually reduces the energy of the system. Right? So you're basically, the, the universe is taking energy and putting it into the disordered, organized modes, and that consequently leads to a minimum of the total energy. It's actually a stabilizing effect to do that. Okay? Chemistry and physics likes to be steady states, if you will, like to be as messy and as lazy as possible, just like your roommate. Okay, so again, this seems like a really not very interesting result. I mean, it is interesting, but there's not really much we can do with it, right? Because it doesn't really tell us where the piston ends up. It just tells us what we will measure when the piston stops. Okay, but there's probably a way that you can take this information and then parameterize it based on the piston position to figure it out. And that's totally possible, but it's not really the point of this discussion. All right, what I really want to say is, is that temperature equality is a very important thing. And having two systems equilibrate in temperature means that you've reached some sort of thermodynamic equilibrium. And this will introduce us to the next concept. Hopefully I've got some space on this slide. Let me zoom out and see if I should just make a new one. Yeah, let's do a little bit more on this. We can put some stuff at the bottom. All right, so I'm going to close this off. OK, so what this means, though, there's a very important consequence of this action. And it's called the zero, I'm going to define it. It's a dumb name, but it's what it's called. It's called the zero law of thermodynamics. Right, this is one of the four laws of thermodynamics. Just like in Newton's laws, we have three laws, right? Inertia, F equals MA. Every reaction is an equal and opposite reaction. Thermodynamics also has a set of laws. And we've already seen some of them, but this is one we haven't seen yet because we weren't able to define it. But it says that if, if, two system, if three systems, so let me say it this way, OK? If system, let me be very clear about this. I don't want to be confusing. So um, consider three boxes or three systems, subsystems, A, B, and C, that are allowed to exchange energy with each other. All right, maybe I can draw it for you. We can draw what that little box looks like. So you've got this big box that's closed. And in it are three little boxes, A, B, and C. They've got different components. It doesn't matter what the variables are. They're just three different boxes. All right, so we have box A, box B, and box C. All right, and they're allowed to exchange energy with each other. So I'm going to have them exchange energy, heat, if you will, through little squiggly lines. All right, so this is heat, energy, however you want to think of it. OK. If, and the statement of the, of the first set, the, the zero flow of thermodynamics is this. If the temperature of A is equal to the temperature of B, and the temperature of B is equal to the temperature of C, then the temperature of A is equal to the temperature of C. All right? It's called syllogism, right? If A then B, B then C, then A then C. Right? Very trivial answer. But what this allows us to do, by assuming this is true, this allows us to create a thermometer. This is the principle of measuring temperature. If this wasn't true, you put a thermometer into your gas, if they can't equilibrate equal temperature, you'll never be able to accurately read the temperature of your box. All right, so this guarantees that we can do that. You can think, for instance, we have two boxes, A and B, that have some gas in them, and here's your little mercury thermometer, C. All right, and if C measures B, the temperature of B, and they, they equal each other, 
and then you allow A and B to equilibrate, and you still read on C the same temperature as B, then that means A is at the same temperature as well. All right? This confirms that we can measure temperature, and that it's a, something that is actually valid. Now, I know that seems trivial because you've been measuring temperature for your entire life. Right? You feel it on your body. You, you're, you know, maybe your mom had one of those little weather things on your, you know, you're, you watch the weather channel. Right? You've been measuring this shit all the time. It's a very, very trivial result, but it's a super important one. And what it, what it means, though, is, is this concept that equilibrium, the idea of thermal equilibrium means that everything has the same temperature. Right? So when we think two things are equilibrium with each other thermally, that means they have the same temperature. Okay? And that allows us now to accurately measure the temperature. Okay? But here's the problem. Now we want to create a thermometer. How do we define our temperature scale? What is our reference? Right? Because as far as we can tell, the only things we can measure are changes in energy. Right? Everything that we've determined so far has been through du which is just the change in the energy. It has nothing to do with the initial value or the final value. We don't care, those don't matter here. We only know about the dynamics as it changes towards equilibrium. So we can only measure things relative to something else. And we're gonna see that time and time again in this class. It's very hard to measure absolute energy, but it's very easy to measure relative energy compared to something, a standard, a reference. Right? This is a class about changes, differences. So it's very hard. So we have to define what is our reference point for temperature, right? If you've already worked on problem two, which has probably been very confusing to you, this in fact is dealing with this problem exactly. And let me talk about that, right? So how do we create a temperature scale? What is the te how do we define temperature? So we'll, we'll, there are different ways to define temperature. Okay. What we'll find is that they're all equivalent. But they have different contexts. So let me give you an example. Maybe you have a thermometer, right? An old mercury thermometer or a rectal thermometer, just a normal old thermometer, right? That's, what is a thermometer? Well, it's a piece of glass, some material or a piece of metal, in the case of a rectal thermometer, that, or, or like a, a biological thermometer, that, that changes, some, something changes in it, right? In the case of the mercury, it's the height of the mercury it changes as a function of the temperature. Right, but how do we define that change in, in mercury height to a physical quantity that is universal everywhere? Right, because you may be, for instance, right, mercury, the uh, mercury thermometer is defined based on the fact that one atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury. Right? And, but if you go to Mars, one atmosphere is not 760. It's much less because there's less atmosphere, there's less pressure. So the mercury thermometer is a completely and utterly worthless device if you take it somewhere else because now it's referenced to a different value, which is the pressure of Mars. So then you have to know the pressure of Mars. But you see what we've done here is we've referenced our temperature scale to the pressure of the environment that we're in. That's not very good because we can measure pressure here, and then we move to Mars, and we got to redo everything, right? We have to change all our units, change all our calibrations, right? Uh, I don't think Elon wants to do that, right? So we have to define something universal, right? Something that's true here, it's true in the everywhere in the universe for every weird ass alien, for including Elon, always the same number, right? A, a fixed reference that is universal, and there are two. There's, there's a couple of different ones. Engineers use a slightly different one than we chemists do. And me as a spectroscopist, we can use light to determine our temperature. Astronomers use a different type of, of temperature scale. But they're all referenced to something that's universal. So let me introduce to you the chemical temperature scale. And I, I just need to look up one number really quickly, um, just so I don't give you the wrong number again. Okay, so, so in the context of the zero flaw, we need a box that can equilibrate to all the other boxes. We have this thermometer box, okay? So what is that box? 
right? That box is, is defined explicitly you know, and by the world. By the, you know, this is an international standard. So we have a box. Um, let's just, it doesn't really matter what the size is, but let's just be, let's just be consistent. The box is one meter by one meter by one meter. Okay, so it has volume meter cubed. Right, so V is one meter cubed. Again, the volume doesn't matter, as we'll see, but I just want to be consistent. All right? I just want to keep everything explicit. All right, inside of it, we're going to put water. So we've got some waters in here. That's not water. That's water. We're going to put water in here. All right, so it's a box of water, a one meter cubed box of water. set to the conditions where H2O liquid, H2O gas, and ice, H2OS, coexist simultaneously. So there is a, as we'll learn when we get to phases, there is a point, a temperature or pressure, and a, vault, a temperature and a pressure, that where if you jiggle the temperature one way or the pressure one way, you get water. If you, you, get a, you basically it, it liquefies. If you jiggle it another way, it vaporizes. If you jiggle it another way, it freezes. Right? Does anyone know what this place is called? You want to know the term for this point? You know what it's called? Anyone? It's a good reason why it's called why why there when it's a good reason why it's called this because there are three things in equilibrium with each other. It's called the triple point. Triple point. Okay? As we'll see, for a pure material, like water, any material in fact, there is exactly one temperature and pressure, pair of temperature and pressure, where all three liquid phase and gas coexist simultaneously. Okay, it's called the triple point. One of the, thing, one of the great contributions of Josiah Gibbs is that he proved this. That a pure material has exactly one point, and only one point, in, in temperature pressure space, where all three of the phases coexist simultaneously. It's called the triple point. We'll learn that rule in a couple of weeks. All right, and the triple point is defined very explicitly. The triple point is at temperature 273.16 Kelvin and at a pressure of, um, I'm going to give it to you in a couple of different units, 0060373 atmospheres. Okay, so the atmosphere, if you don't know what an atmosphere is, one atmosphere is the atmospheric pressure of the world, of the, of the earth, right, standard pressure at sea level. Oh, I'm sorry, that's really hard to see. Let me, let me make that a little brighter. All right, I, I got to change that color for you guys. 273.16, and the pressure is 0 0.06, 0, 0, 0.060373 atmospheres. Um, which is equivalent to 6.1173 millibar. And, and we'll talk about pressure units later. All right, we'll, we'll, I'll introduce a bunch of them when we talk about the ideal gas and, non, and real ga and gases, all right, which will be, I think, on next Tuesday, or maybe even next class. Okay, so at this temperature and pressure, regardless of the volume, and we'll explain, I'll explain why it doesn't matter, why the volume doesn't matter in a second. Um, is, so 273.16, oh, sorry I put the wrong thing, I forgot to put that 0.16, and this pressure, all three of these coexist simultaneously. And so these are fixed numbers, all right? So we just say these, the triple point happens, we can observe it, and it's exactly at this temperature and pressure, okay? The reason why the volume doesn't matter again is because of the ideal gas law, right? Volume doesn't actually matter here. V can be interchanged with P, I'm just going to make a note here, nota bueno, with P for an ideal gas, 
because of the ideal gas law, right? P is equal to nRT over V, right? V and P are effectively the same thing. They're just reciprocals of each other in an ideal gas. Okay, so we, all, we can either define it by a volume and a temperature, or we can define it by a pressure and a temperature. I think it's easier to do by pressure, because then you can put it in annual material. You can put it in annual box and get the same result. Okay, so, so the thing is, is that our scale is defined by one point, one point only. Right? So everything is reference relative to this. Right? There has to be, unfortunately, when you do a unit conversion, there has to be two points because you need a linear relationship between the two, vari two, two variables. Right? If you want to do a unit conversion or something, right? you want, if you want to calibrate something, you need two points. Okay, so we have to figure out eventually what's the other point. Right? You need two points to form a line, right? To define a scale. So we'll have to come back to that. All right? We're not quite there yet. That's a tricky problem. Right? What, what other point can we define? Okay? Um, and the th so we'll learn some more laws as we go, these laws of thermodynamics, and the third law will tell us what the other point is. Okay? So we're gonna it, it requires a little more understanding of entropy. But entropy will allow, will allow us to understand where the other point in our scale is. Okay? And just to spoil it, the other point is zero Kelvin, absolute zero. Okay? So we can define an energy scale or temperature scale with this, the triple point of water and the idea of absolute zero. Right? And I'll explain what I mean by the idea of absolute zero uh, hopefully next week. But don't worry. So this is the chemical temperature scale, right? This is why it's 273.16 Kelvin. I have no idea why they picked that number because I, you could make it 300 Kelvin if you wanted. Everything is just a number. I don't know why they picked that. I don't know the reason why these things are done the way they are, um, but they are. So that's the definition of temperature, okay? So if we want to measure temperature precisely, we're going to take a box of water, set it to this position, and then measure the energy difference between that box of water at this condition and our box. Everything is reference relative to that. Problem two in the homework, right? So, so let me just say one thing, right? This is not a very practical thermometer, right? You've got to carry around a giant box of water with a precisely defined temperature and pressure at all times, right? It's impossible. But you could certainly create one if you wanted as a standard and a reference. But it's not very practical, right? So we're going to choose a different material to measure relative to this, right? That's why we choose mercury. That's why we choose, as you'll learn in lab, that's why we choose these to measure temperature with what are called thermocouples, which are just pieces of metal, two different metals, right? And problem two talks about the problems with measuring temperature of a system by using something like a metal, like a metal thermometer. The problem with metal thermometers is that as you start to heat the metal, the metal expands. And so we, as you'll observe in problem two, that as the metal expands, your definition of the, of the meat meter changes. Because what was one meter at zero Celsius is no longer a meter at 100 Celsius. So now your length scale is temperature dependent. Okay, so we have to come up with a correction for that. And the way that we do it, which is the second part of that problem, is to take two pieces of metal that both expand and the rate at which the length scale expands is actually rep proportional to the difference of how the two metals expand relative to each other. Um, and this is literally how we measure temperature accurately in 99% of all contexts. Um, it, and all the thermometers at high temperature, so all the temperature sensors in your car, um, the ones that, yeah, you know, the air exhaust temperature, the intake temperature, the post -cat catalytic converter temperature sensor, right? These things can run at 2,000, 3,000 Kelvin. The gases, of course, in the car engine are very hot. If you put a, right, if you put an alcohol thermometer or mercury thermometer in there, it's gonna shatter instantaneously, right? Obviously, actually, alcohol boils and mercury boils at that temperature, you can't even use it. So you have to come up with a, a way to measure temperature at high temperatures, and we use the expansion characteristics of metal because metals, again, you have to heat really, really high for them to melt. Um, we use the expansion characteristics of the metal to measure temperature. And what we do is we have two different metals that both expand at slightly different rates. And if we know how they both expand relative to each other, we can calculate how the temperature changes 
as a function of the difference of those expansions. And that turns out to be extremely accurate, right? And you can, with, a, with these two metal contact thermometers, which we call thermocouples, um, you can measure temperature sensitively as uh, one part in 1,000 or one part in 10,000, okay? Which would mean that at 1,000 Celsius, you have an accuracy of one Celsius, which is much better than what you get with mercury, okay? So the problem two explores that a little bit. But the prop, but again, the issue with this, again, we always have to take a limit. We always have to take a, a, a hit somewhere. There's always a kind of a give and take. And the take here is, is that this is not a very practically usable method. But the advantage is, is that this is true everywhere in the universe. It doesn't matter what, where you are in the universe, water always has a triple point at this point. So you can always use this as your relative scale. Any questions about that? Okay. Cool. So now that we know that temperature can be measured, it's taken us two weeks to get to this point. But again, not an obvious point. And there are many systems in the world that you can't measure the temperature. Maybe at some point we'll talk about some of them. All right. So what I want to introduce now is let's let's use this to our advantage. All right. Now that we have a way to measure temperature. What happens to a system? Let's start thinking about what, are, what's, what, what, what can we do with temperature? How can we track things? What if we fix the temperature? What if we put our box in a water bath that is on a hot plate that has a thermos, the thermos, you know, thermostat that allows it to be at a fixed temperature? Okay, so let's think about that. That might be a nice thing to do. In fact, you do this all the time, right? Right? You, when you for instance, when you well, when you melt ice, for instance, that's an isothermal process. You're exchanging heat from the outside, and it's melting the ice inside, and that melting emits heat. Right? Melting, melting. Oh, sorry, melting's endothermic. It pulls heat out, and when you freeze, it pushes heat out. Right? You can exchange from the environment energy with your system. So let's think about that. It's a very common way to do chemistry: is you put something in a bath that is fixed temperature. Okay, so then we have a very specific term for that. So, a, a process that where the temperature doesn't change is called an iso isothermal process. Right? Iso means same in uh, Greek. I think it's Greek. Um, maybe it's Latin. And thermal, of course, means heat. An isothermal process. All right. So this is the process where the temperature does not change. Right? And the way to think about what this looks like in terms of our boxes is very simple. You're going to have a, a big closed box with a material inside of it. Let's say water. Right? We'll fill it with water. And inside of that box, we're going to submit, we're going to submerge a box inside of it. Right? That's diathermal. So energy can exchange but not mass. All right? So we have, we have a box inside of here that's V, U, V, and N. And the box, so this, is, this box is diathermal, where its energy can exchange. Right? And the temperature of the water, imagine that the volume of this box is, the volume of the water bath is so giant compared to the small box that it does, the temperature never fluctuates. Okay? It's just a giant constant temperature bath. All right, so this is your, you can think of this as your hot, this is like a hot plate. right? This is a water bath at T. Okay? And the temperature can't change. Okay? So let's say, for instance, right, we want to think about what this box does, given some initial conditions, when it's stuck in this bath. And also how, for instance, if we want to change the box, maybe we want to expand the box, make it bigger, smaller, or something like that, make it stretchable. How does the energy flow in and out of the box? Okay. So before we tackle this, I want to, before we get into that, you know, that big Gibbs equation that we use. We've got about 15 minutes left, great. Um, I want to give you a slightly older perspective 
on that equation that I think will help us a little bit here. Right, I'm going to put it over here on the side. Right, where Let's just remember over here that du, I'm just going to write TDS minus PDV. All right, we're not going to worry about chemical flowing. Okay, so du is this. All right, so again, remember that these, each of these contributions to the energy are different motions that are, right, ds are, represents all the motions that are averaged out, and PDV are all these stretching motions of the gas inside of it. Let me call this heat and work, right? So the interpretation, the old school interpretation of this is that this is heat. This is the heat energy. And this is the work. All right, so your system can do a little bit of work to change the energy, can exchange heat with the surrounding environment um, to, 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 to cause a ch total change in energy. Okay, so there's another way to write this, and this is from Joule way, way long ago, way before, I think Henry Joule was around before even Gibbs was born. What Henry Joule says is he wrote this like this, and he's totally right. He says that the change in energy is a sum of the change in heat, which is Q, I'll just write that in a second, times the change in work. All right, so often whenever you see me write the letter Q, that means heat. So this is heat, and W stands for work. All right, so this is what's called the first law of thermodynamics. All right, I won't ever call it that anymore, um, but if you look it up in the textbook, there's a whole chapter on the first law. And the first law is, is that the change in energy is a sum of heat and work transfer. I'm sorry, you really can't see that. I gotta change that color, guys, I'm sorry. Let me get that a little brighter. So this is heat, and this is work. This is what's called the first law of thermodynamics. But if you compare this equation to this one, you'll see that they, they say the same thing. Right? It says that du is a mix of heat and work, right? and so you can just equate these two things together. Right, and, they, and the correlation between Gibbs and Joule is this, that dq is equal to TDS, and dw is equal minus PDV. Right, pretty straightforward. Right. That's exactly what we said. That entropy has something to do with these motions you can't measure. You just know they're there. That's the heat. And work has something to do with actual changes in the physical dimensions of the system, which is work. Okay, so now the, the useful thing, so let me talk, there's some advantages to doing it the way Joule is, right? Because Joule's approach is very logical, right? You can imagine intuitively the difference between work and heat. Let me explain what I mean by that. All right, think about the way if you have a, a glass of ice sitting on the counter, if you leave it out, nothing happens to you, right? It's just sitting there, nothing's happening, but what happens? The ice eventually melts, right? And that's because the heat from the external environment is coming into that glass to melt the ice. Right? So you're changing the energy of your water, causing a phase transition through pure transfer of heat. Now you can do the equivalent thing by taking that glass of water right? and then putting a little turbine in it, a little, little wheel, and spin that wheel really, really fast to create friction with the water. Right? That's doing work. Right? You're doing physical mechanical work. You're applying a force to exert, exerting a force over some object that moves in distance. Right? It's this little thing that's spinning. And when you do that, you also find that even that you'll also that you'll melt the ice even faster than if you were just to sit there. Right? So you can apply this. You can apply work to get the same change in energy, or you can just sit there and watch the heat transfer to get the same energy. Right? So work and heat are the same things, but they're done in different contexts. Right? Different modes, as we've talked about. But there's a problem that Joule had with this approach. The problem is, is that if you want to think about, you have a change from point A to point B. Right? You go from frozen water to melted water. The way that that's done can be of any mix of heat and work. You don't really know how the total change is divvied up between heat and work. Even worse than that, is that there are ways to 
um, exert the same amount of change with the same proportion of heat and work, but with different motions. For instance, I could use three propellers instead of one. Or I could blow a hot, a hot gun at my, um, what do you call it? At my water to freeze it, right? And apply more heat to freeze it. Or I could heat it, refreeze it, and then use my piston, or my, sorry, not my piston, but my, my wheel to melt it again, and then do it again, 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 and again, and then until it's melted again, I, I've exerted the same change in energy, I've just gone back and forth, point A, point B, point A, point B, point B, in different ways. So what that means is that the change in the work and the change in the heat is what we call path dependent, right? It depends on the path that you take to get to point A to point B, right? Whether you use one propeller, or two propellers, three propellers, you melt it, freeze it, melt it, freeze it, melt it, freeze it, melt it, freeze it. Doesn't matter, right? It depends on the path. So Joule's, Joule, Joule's problem is, is that you have this very logical approach to partitioning the energy between work and heat, things that move and things that don't move that have energy. But the problem is, is that you can't analyze it really that well because it depends on how that heat is transferred and how that work is transferred. It's a path-dependent property. So DQ and DW, these are what are called path-dependent functions. Right? There's another term that people use called inexact differentials. I don't want to go into the details between an exact and an inexact derivative. But the idea is, is that the amount of change in work depends on a path. And the amount of change in heat depends on a path. However, this equality is true. This is not true. Oh, are you okay over there? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, on the right-hand side of the equation, these are path independent. S and V only depend on the initial and the final conditions. It does not matter how you go from point A to point B. Heating flow, right? The only thing that it matters on is the original point S of the initial state and the S of the final state. Path doesn't matter. We'll see that in this class. I'll prove it to you, hopefully, in the next couple days. I think probably next class. So the right-hand side is, left-hand side is path-dependent, but it's a very logical way to think about energy flow. And the right-hand side is much harder to interpret, but it's path-independent. Right? So we have a very specific term for these things. So these are path-independent. Um, and only depend, and so therefore ds, for instance, is the entropy of the final state minus the entropy of the initial state. And it doesn't matter how you get from initial to final, and this value is always the same. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll explore this when we talk about processes in a little more detail. But the idea is, is this, this makes the math much easier. Because now we don't have to worry about how we get from point A to point B. We only need to know the points. All right, so what we call those, so S and, so in this case, uh, U and S, these functions of energy, are what are called path functions. Sorry, not path functions. <laughs> That's the wrong word. That's the other one. State functions, sorry called state functions. Um, which means that the only that the change in them which means that ds or du is only dependent on the beginning and end point, not the path. It's only dependent on the initial and final state, not the intermediate states. All right? So that means that we can always analyze the energy flow in a reaction with entropy, in, for instance, for entropy. We don't have to worry about how you do it. The change in entropy is always the same as long as you go from the same starting point and end up at the same final point. It doesn't matter which path you take the value of ds will always be the same. 
that's very, very powerful because it makes our math a lot easier. Okay? So in the next uh, seven minutes, let's, let's start looking at what that does here, okay, in our case. Okay, so let me, let me just go back one more page. Sorry, I, I want to copy this box over because I want to look at it one more time. Diathermal box that allow exchange energy of this water that's set to temperature T. Okay? Now, if the system is allowed to exchange energy with the box at all times, right? It's an, always in equilibrium with the box. Alright, so what does that mean? Well, that means that if the water is at temp T, T water is T, then T box is also T, right? That's isothermal conditions, right? Everything is at the same temperature. Okay, so what can we say about the total energy of this system? Well, if that's the case, right, if you have, if the energy is freely able to move between the two boxes, the water bath and the box, and they have the same temperature, that means that again, the energy is conserved in that system. And because they're the same temperature, that means they're in equilibrium, right? That's what we determined last class. And what did we say about equilibrium? That du is zero and it's a minimum and ds is a maximum. And it's also at ds is equal to zero, right? It's at a maximum, local maximum or global maximum of the energy surface, and u is at a minimum, right? So we can apply that here. So this means that the entropy is equal to zero and maximum, and du is equal to zero and minimum. Okay, so what does that mean then? So that means then if du is equal to TDS minus PDV, which is equal to dq plus dw, depending on who you talk to, where you talk to Gibbs or Joule, is equal to zero, right? du is zero, because we're at equilibrium. So that means, therefore, that the entropy change times the temperature of the system, when, when the box is expanded, for instance, is equal and opposite to the work. What that means is, is that every unit of work that you do to expand the box is coming from heat. Heat is being transferred into that work. Or if you do work on the system and put heat into it, it gets transferred into the heat part. They interconvert with each other. Okay. And so this also means that the change in heat is equal to the opposite of the change in work. Okay. So in like two minutes, we're going to come up with our first important equation for isothermal expansion. What do we care about in our system? Well, we care about the entropy, right? The entropy is the important part of the system. How does the entropy change? Or maybe we care about the energy change or something like that, right? So what do we, how do we want to, so what can we do here? So we want to calculate entropy. So we have ds, we can divide both sides by t, right? So ds is equal to minus p over t dv. All right, so now let's make an assumption about our box. Right? We're going to make an assumption, we're going to say that this is an, is an ideal gas inside of there, okay? Ideal gas. So with the ideal gas law, we can write vol pressure in terms of volume. Right? P is equal to N R T over V. Alright, so let's plug it in. Okay. 
All right. So we have minus nRT over V divided by T times the change in volume. Right? And as you can see, the, vo the temperatures cancel. T over T. Right? So the temperature cancels out in this calculation. The change in entropy is independent of temperature, as it should be because it's isothermal. The temperature is not changing. Right? So it should only be dependent on the things that are changing, which in this case is the volume. Right? And so now ds is equal to n r over v dv. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. So we have now an equation ds is equal to minus n r over v dv. So how do we calculate the entropy? Well, we integrate both sides, right? If you have a derivative and you want to calculate the actual function you take in derivative of, you take an integral of it, the antiderivative. So we're going to integrate both sides of this equation. And we'll integrate it from the initial point to the final point, whatever they may be. So on one side, we're going to have, we're going to integrate ds. Right? And we're going to integrate it from point 0 to point the final point. Right? So we'll call that, um, let's say, s of s0 to s final. Um, is that the right way to say it? Yeah, that's right. And that's going to be equal to the integral from v0 to v final of minus n r over v dv. Okay. So let's, let's clean this up a little bit. The n and the r are not integrable. They're just numbers. So we can factor them out. And we're left with an integral over v that's very simple. We're integrating 1 over v dv. Okay. So let's do, let's do the left hand side here. Does it, what's the integral of, like, say, dx? Take the integral of just the differential. What do you get? x. So the final answer is going to be x evaluated at the final entropy minus x evaluated at the initial entropy, which is just delta s. So this is going to be s final minus s0, which is equal to delta s. And this is equal to minus nr. And what's the integral of 1 over x? Does anyone remember? This is one of the tricky ones. That's the log. Yeah, it's the log. Right? So some people will say 1 over v squared right, or something like that. No, it's the log here. So now, so the integral of 1 over x dx, I'll just write it here. So just to remind you, this is a really good one to remember if you don't remember it. Uh, 1 over x dx is the log of x, natural log of x plus c. So we have that now evaluated at the log of vf minus the log of v naught, the initial volume. All right, and how can we rewrite a difference of logarithms? Does anyone remember their log? Say it again. Yeah, a fraction, right? So the log of a fraction is the log of the difference of the numerator and the difference of the logs of the numerator. I'll write that formula for you really quickly here. So the log, the log of A minus the log of B is equal to the log of A over B. Right? And as you know, log of A plus log of B is a log of A times B. And so what that means now is we have a beautiful equation, very, very simple equation, that the change in entropy and an expansion process, right? we're changing volumes, so we're expanding the box or, deep, or collapsing the box in this isothermal bath, is equal to minus nR log v2 or vf over v0. Um, I have a, sorry, I have a negative sign problem here. Yeah, sorry, it should be plus pdb. 
Like if DU is equal to TDS minus PVD, it's equal to zero, so DS is equal to PVD. I forgot the minus, I forgot to get rid of the minus sign. So this is a positive, this is a positive, this is a positive, this is a positive, this is a positive. Sorry about that. So the entropy change in isothermal conditions is very simple for a noble gas or an ideal gas. It's NR, right? this, is a, this number of moles in the box, gas constant times the log of the volume difference. Right? Problem four on the homework has you go back and, and do this calculation one more time, calculate this value, and then it gives you an alternate way to explore entropy and get the same value. We'll explore that concept next class. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. I will see you on Thursday. Sorry for running a little late.